It's called the White Paper for Vulnerable Children, and if there's one thing that can be agreed on, it's that New Zealand has too many hurt and neglected young people. The government's new child action plan will target the 20 to 30,000 children considered most at risk. And in her introduction to the new policy, Social Development Minister Paula Bennett says we can and will do better. The minister is our guest this morning, and on our press panel, Alex Tarrant is away, but John Hardy Velt, political reporter for Fairfax, is with us. Good morning to you both. Welcome to you too, Minister. Thanks for coming in this morning. In the Green Paper, you first highlighted 163,000 children at significant risk. The White Paper, though, is focusing on... 20 to 30,000. So mm. what happens to the other 130,000 or so? Yeah, I think we said that that 163,000 um, are whom we considered um, vulnerable at that point when we gave it that kind of definition. And then as we've worked our way through the work, we've decided we're going to target those um, sort of 20 to 30,000 who we see at, at most risk. So who we think are most likely to be hurt or neglected or are currently um, actually being maltreated. We've removed them. We're going to do better by them. So you've, you've narrowed your focus mm. In essence, but there are still children, aren't there, on the outside of that 20 to 30,000 who are vulnerable? There always will be. I mean, that's the reality of wherever you put a line, um, some are going to fall within and some are going to fall without. I think one of the things I've seen over time is we've tried to scatter across so many that we haven't got to those that need it most. So this paper is without a doubt focused on those children who I think need this help the most. Minister, how did you arrive at the 20 to 30,000 figure? Who are these children? Yeah, well, um, I didn't, is the good news. So that's where we um, embarked on some research with um, Auckland University and it was them that have gone through and said these, we can tell you who these sort of 30,000 children are who are most, A, there are those that honours, uh, obviously right now with child, youth and family so we've removed them from their home or intensively working with them and then I want to get ahead of the problem because otherwise we are just the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff so the others are ones who we say are most at, at risk of being um, seriously what's mistreated. The, what's the profile, a typical profile? Can you give us a typical profile? Well the profile that they have done and they've used about 130 uh, 132 factors, sorry, to actually come up with what that profile looks like. But it can be um, obviously those that are being maltreated now, we know what, what that profile is. For the others, you're looking at things like um, parental history of um, child abuse and neglect, um, frequent change of address might come into it, the age of the parents, the fact if one of them has been in prison before, um, say previous notifications, it's those sorts of fairly clear cut. And do you think that these types of children, more of them will be removed from their homes? No. In fact, I think less will be. So we're removing fewer children now than we were four years ago, and I expect that trend to continue. Is because that the right trend, though? Well, we'll be getting a, an, in front of the problem and actually dealing with the issues right around them, because actually the state doesn't have a great reputation for raising these children either. No, but then a lot of parents don't either, and we often look at the rights of parents and think that they're given more rights than children are. Some children do need to mm. be removed from family environments, don't they? because of the cycle of abuse, you take them away from a parent and you give them to an uncle or an aunt and quite often that cycle continues. Mm. So it's a constant you, it's a constant line that we walk, that social workers walk really, on when do you remove, when don't you, whereas um, with obviously always putting the child's safety paramount and at the centre of um, all thinking and all decision making, um, I think we're getting it about right, but we have to constantly be challenging ourselves on that. OK, let's look at the database because you know doctors, teachers, etc. are going to be compelled or encouraged to, to to put information into this database. Mm -hmm. uh Who's this, in essence the last line of defence? Who acts? What professional acts when you think, OK, we're getting a bit of a history here? Mm. So that's a really good. So first of all, we've got to put all the pieces together. And that hasn't been happening. And we've seen it in far too many of the serious cases and, quite frankly, not so serious cases that we've seen where, you know, lots of different professionals held a piece of the puzzle, but no one had put it all together. So that's what the purpose of the database and the information sharing is. So then we get that information together. It's who acts on it. Some will be immediate. Yeah, so one, some will be, this is serious, it is a police or a child, youth and family intervention, um, let's go. Who We've got the call? new child protect line. We have a group of professionals that are sitting there that have real-time access to all information as it's being inputted, and they make the call as to where that, that child is triaged to, if you like. And that's where setting up the children's teams. It's one thing to identify them, but unless you're doing something about it and something with them, then you're only actually doing a small piece of this. So then those children teams will act accordingly that's a group of professionals. Professor David Ferguson, um, speaking about the white paper, has raised the, the issue of um, stigmatising um, parents and children. Mm. Is that a concern for you? Huge. 
um, and right from the start it has been. So it's been since I've been Minister that I have had the experts saying to me, we think we can get ahead of the problem and identify who are the children that are most likely to be abused or neglected. And I struggled with it. I just sort of went, well, do you, is it at that point that you identify them and start working around them? Are you stigmatising them? Are you almost being a part of the problem instead of the solution? And then I get to a stage where I say, knowing what I know, so knowing that those children are more likely to be abused than not, how can I not actually then do something with that information and give them the right kind of services and support? So, so Professor Ferguson has suggested um, trialling that tool. Why are you charging ahead and, and rolling it out on a nationwide basis without, without a trial? Well, I think we are taking it step by step. So the first thing, we, I mean, this is not something we dreamt up last week. We've actually been working on this for years. The second part I would say is that we're going to have um, a group of experts that walk alongside of us to make sure that we're using the information correctly, that we've got the right checks and balances in place. I've got academics that are going to help. The Office of the Privacy Commissioner have, has, has offered real assistance. I'm going to get um, those with the ethics involved so that we really are. They tell me none of these problems are insurmountable. OK, you say also that um, there will be no mandatory reporting, but you're compelling, if you like, agencies to report. Is that not mandatory reporting in some way? I think it's almost... There'll be, there'll be um, a code, won't I, there? Yeah, there will. There'll be a code of practice. It will be very clear on what our expectations are of people without taking that extra step into mandatory reporting and with the disadvantages that can come with that. And the disadvantages of, I think, mandatory reporting are you get too many false positives, so you are, again, working with children that really don't need okay. it, and, again, you've lowered that threshold. If this doesn't work, is mandatory reporting still on the table, or have you closed the door on that? Look, at this point, I've closed the door. I don't really want to have that debate for the next two years. I want to get on with the um, very big and significant work that needs to be done in this paper, but that doesn't mean that decisions can't be, be changed in the future. And, and one of the things you've said um, is that there will be a lot of training for these professionals, but there's hundreds of thousands of them, isn't there? Yes. Um, and is there going to be a standardised training course? Um, who's going to do the training? Are, are we anywhere near a position of implementing training for these professionals? There's already training organisations that do it. Um, there's uh, Child Matters in Hamilton, um, there's another very good one in Christchurch um, that are NGOs and they specialise in actually um, identifying the signs of abuse and neglect. So uh, they will, they've will they already been instigating, um, they've gone around early childhood centres and making sure teachers and um, others do. So we are looking to extend that and have that kind of So it will be the done. government funding a private organisation to what, to, to go to teachers' colleges and, and do um, professional development exercises, that sort of thing? Yeah, and, and in some cases they are going into um, a GP's practice and meeting with everyone after hours and, and doing um, a course with them. Uh, they run regular courses. So we are more likely than not to actually get it from um, outside agencies. I don't see the need for us to set up something ourselves if there's something very good out there already. Um, and they're already doing it. They've got it in place. But, I mean, it just it amazes me that doctors and nurses sometimes have no more than an hour's lecture through their training on how to identify the signs. We have to pick up that.